Welcome to Oxford University, where my guest is a man who favours more drugs than sport, who thinks cloning is cool, and who says that if the technology were available, then yes, we should genetically modify our children. No stranger to controversy, an A-grade guaranteed conversation starter at dinner parties. Welcome, Julian Savalescu. Hello. Aussie boy, I should point out, born in Geelong Hospital, I believe. Backs the house. Backs the house. Now, I, I don't wish to start on too personal a note, but is it true that you were one of the ugliest babies <laughs> ever born at Geelong <laughs> Hospital? I brought that up. Apparently I had a bullet head that was uh, unparalleled in the hospital. <laughs> um, fortunately, it's reduced somewhat. Were people gathering around to marvel? I don't know, but uh, my mother has told me many times I was the ugliest child ever born there. <laughs> Only a mother can say that. Is this where your interest in genetic modification comes uh, from? No, that's not where it came. Uh, it came from my background in medicine, but uh, as I uh, took up a position at the Murdoch Children's Institute, Research Institute, um, at the time when the human genome um, was being unravelled, uh, I came to understand the, the profound potential of genetics, not just to influence disease, but to influence um, how we are and how we develop and our character, personality and physical abilities. We've well, got some amazing things to talk about. We'll get to those. But first of all, you are the Chair of Practical Ethics here at the Faculty of Philosophy. What exactly are you paid to do? Well, I'm paid to do uh, a lot of things. I'm, I'm primarily paid to uh, do research and do teaching in these sorts of areas. And practical ethics is the idea that uh, ethics can inform practice, what people do, how they live their lives, how society develops, what sorts of research we do. Can you give me an example of, of practical ethics that I could or would apply in my life? Well, I mean, whether you sign an organ donor card uh, or sign, you know, that you're willing to give up your organs at, uh, after, uh, after a car accident, I mean, this is an area where you can make a difference and many people don't. So what sorts of policies should we have about obtaining organs to deal with the huge shortage of organs? Should we be taking organs from people routinely when they die unless they object? Should we be taking them anyway? Or should we require for people to give consent as they do now? See, I favour random organ harvesting. There you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think uh, if we were able to just extract organs from people when they died, we'd probably have enough without having to harvest them from, uh, from living people. Oh, so you're a soft line on this. Oh, I'm, I'm, a very, I'm a moderate. You're a moderate. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a hard line organ uh, yeah. harvester. Yeah. There you go. And uh, we'll have your kidney when this interview is done. Thank you very well, much. Well, I do think we should be able to sell our organs if we want, but that's another issue. I know. Is that right? Uh, I think that uh, we should have the freedom to do what we want with our bodies. Uh, and after all, people modify their bodies uh, and the, cause, you know, the beauty industry and so on. Um, people have uh, a you know, healthy penis cut off when they want to be a woman. If somebody wants to sell their organ to benefit somebody else, I think the only interesting issue is whether they're paid a fair price for it. Mm. I've actually invested quite a lot of money to look like Brad Pitt. How do you think it's going? <laughs> um, well, uh, let's uh, just say I don't think he's going to be out of a job many times soon. I see. All right. Well, I consider myself dissed. You've got a lot of interesting views on drugs and sport. Let's start there. And mm -hmm. One of the things you said is that performance enhancement isn't against the spirit of sport. In, f in fact, it is the spirit of sport. What do you mean by that? Well, ever since you know, people started competing in sport, they've been trying to improve their performance, not just through training, but by, by taking substances and trying to modify themselves. Uh, and for example, in cycling, ever since um, cycling, professional cycling began in the early 1900s, people were taking things like strychnine and cocaine, alcohol, uh, amphetamines. Um, uh, somebody once asked um, one Tour de France uh, winner you know, how, how often he'd use La Bomba, um, which was amphetamines, and he said only when absolutely necessary. And they said, well, how often precisely is that? And he said, most of the time. Isn't the Athenian ideal of the Olympics, though, that you improve performance through hard work, through noble effort and exertion? You could try to, to achieve that ideal, but my view is that, that humans um, aren't just like greyhounds or horses that, that we sort of flog on a race and we see which one's the sort of strongest. Humans make decisions, they decide how to train, and they also make decisions about how to change themselves. And the question for sport is, you know, what will be the limits of that change? It's up to us to decide what we want sport to be, and, and my view is it's... It's a great shame that we, we run these races and then immediately after we, we take the winner off the podium because they've taken a drug that we've caught them taking that probably many other competitors are taking and the people who are just the smartest are the ones that win. How does this work in practice, for instance, if it was cycling or, or pistol shooting? Does everybody get equal access to whatever drugs they think are well, going to help them? Take one example. So in cycling and, and many performance and endurance events, um, how much oxygen your body can carry is a, is a very big determinant. So what these cyclists do is they take 
uh, EPO, which is a which is a hormone that the body naturally produces to make more red blood cells and carry more oxygen. And um, there's, a, there's 50 different versions. China produces it, um, Russia produces it, and they take this illegally. And so sometimes you pick them up and sometimes you don't. Now, what you could easily do is give up testing for it and simply say, we will measure how many red blood cells you have in your blood, and if you've got over 50% of your blood's red blood cells, you're out. And if it's under, it doesn't matter how you got there, uh, then you can compete. What about someone like Cadell Evans, the Australian cyclist, who's very much against drugs and doesn't want to use them, said he doesn't? Why should he then have to compete or take drugs to have to compete, like EPO, on a, on a level playing field? Well, he doesn't have to take drugs. But if, he, if, if everybody else, if it's open slather, if that's legalised, then he would have to, wouldn't he? Yeah, the proposal I've been pushing is that dr there's drugs or interventions that are safe enough should be permissible. So allowing people to take some EPO or some, some blood augmentation would be... So this would be safe enough. So if he chooses not to take it, that's his choice. How do you define safety? I once said, uh, and got into a bit of trouble over this, but I'll say it again, um, I'd prefer to my child to be given growth hormone by a doctor than to play rugby because I don't know of any ventilator-dependent quadriplegics that have ever occurred from taking growth hormone. A rugby is a dangerous sport. Now, I think rugby should, should be allowed, but it's got risks inherent in it. And if you compare those risks to taking anabolic steroids, the risks are probably greater from injuries uh, than they are from taking anabolic steroids. So people who say that anabolic steroids are too dangerous and, and then uh, you know, play rugby, I think, are, are being inconsistent. This world of... Uh, of enhancement in sport is already upon us. I heard recently that in the London Olympics we're likely to see gene doping. What mm. is that? Yeah, what you, what you can do is um, modify, instead of taking the drug like, for example, we talked about EPO before, um, you can put the gene uh, for, the, for producing more EPO into the, the very sort of heart of the cell. So the body produces the EPO itself. Um, you can do this to a grown adult? You can do this to a grown adult, and there's, there's various ways of doing it. Um, but one way, for example, you could inject genes directly into muscles, and they'd be incorporated into the muscle. And the, way, the only way to detect that would be to take a slice of muscle out of the person and examine the genes. This is a very invasive thing, taking a slice of muscle out of somebody. It's going to be very difficult to detect gene doping. So there are going to be profound changes to how we have to think about sport. So trying to fight a war on anabolic steroids and, uh, and, and EPO, I think, is, is, is really not where the battle is. If genetics, why not bionics? Why, not, why couldn't Usain Bolt have Oscar Pistorius' springy legs, for instance? Why stop there? Yeah, the Pistorius story, I think, is one where I would draw the line. It's possible in, in the near future that these sorts of artificial legs will be made of such a material that people with bilateral amputations will be able to run faster than, uh, than athletes like Bolt. Uh, I'm, I think that will happen. We will develop the technology. Now, I think we should draw a line there and say this is too great a jump in the nature of running. Humans have been running with, with two legs and in a certain way. This would be a different kind of sport. It would be like if we were able, and we could theoretically do this, um, cause people to have webbed hands and feet. Now, that would change the nature of swimming. They'd go much faster. But that would be quite different to giving them a swimming skin. And at that point, you'd have a different sport. That seems to be at the core of the, the difficult difficulty here, the ethical difficulty, which is who makes the decisions about where the line is drawn? I mean, if in your world gene doping is acceptable but bionics aren't, that's not going to be everybody else's world. Uh, how is that line drawn? Who draws it? Yeah, we draw it. And we, we? we being the people, the spectators, the regulators of sport, sport is a, a human activity that has been defined by humans. The rules are what we make them. It's up to us what sport is. I am putting arguments out there for people to consider positions, but in the end, it's up to us to decide which drugs we allow and what we try to achieve. Can I talk about a few formative moments in your life, uh, starting with the first time you heard Peter Singer talk when you were at Monash University? Right. Yeah, I was, uh, I was a medical student and uh, Peter came and gave a couple of lectures on abortion to, well, I think it must have been 150, 200 people. And uh, he, he gave this argument and he said, he was defending infanticide, um, and he said, you know, what is the difference between uh, you know, a fetus inside the, the mother's womb and a newborn baby? I mean, one is just in a different position. 
uh, why do we think that one is fundamentally uh, acceptable to kill and the other one is not? It's the same same being. And uh, this outraged the medical students and, and, and I thought this was a, a very legitimate question to ask and you know, a very provocative one. It requires the strength of character. You, as you would know, Peter Singer has brought a lot of disapproval down his head and hatred and, in fact, threats against his life. Were you aware that as you embarked on this course that you would need a strength of character to put questions which people may not want to hear? Well, I never really thought about it. I mean, I, I just do what I want to do and, and uh, <laughs> sometimes it gets me into trouble. But um, when's, it, when's it really got you into trouble? Well, I remember once I did a, a thing on, um, on Down syndrome and I was asked to write this uh, editorial for the British um, Medical Journal about this big report um, about some, some practices in one of the hospitals here where they've been denying children with Down syndrome heart surgery. So I said, if you really believe that everyone should have equal access, a child with Down syndrome should have the same chance as a child without Down syndrome of getting a heart transplant. And now, do we really believe that? Do we really think that the life expectancy of a child, the quality of the child's life, has no bearing on whether that child should receive something like a heart. And this caused a lot of uh, discussion. And, and the outcome was, I said, we should solve the problem by donating more organs. But, um, but a lot of people were, were quite down on me. And I remember um, John McBain, the head of Melbourne IVF, uh, when I was complaining to him about, about uh, the heat I was being put under. And he said, in uh, Scotland, they had this saying that uh, the worst thing you can say about a man uh, is that he died with no enemies. Mm. Let's talk about children and, and your view on genetic modification. You've said that parents are morally obliged when the technology is available to genetically modify their children. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's important, first of all, to get the distinction between uh, morality and the law clear. When I say morally obliged, it means that they should do it. It's not mm. that they should be forced to do it by sure. the law. Okay. I think we can use many genetic tests to test for diseases. I think people should test to see and to see that they provide their child with the, the least risk of developing serious diseases later in life. Um, but other genes also affect how well our lives go. Just to take an example, I mean, there's a famous set of experiments done in the 60s. This guy called Walter Michelle put a marshmallow in front of three-year-old children. He said, I'm going to go out of the room, don't eat the marshmallow. And if you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll give you two when I come back. So he went out of the room, came back. Some kids had just eaten the marshmallow, some kids hadn't. And uh, he followed these kids up later, 10 years' time. He found those who didn't eat the marshmallow, who were able to control their impulses, delay gratification, had more friends, more motivation to succeed, um, and better academic performance. And this was more highly correlated with their university entrance than their IQ was. So if you had a range of, of embryos, you were able to test for the genes that were related to impulse control, as one day we will be able to, I think those genes are pretty significant. And I'd, I'd certainly want to, to have a child that was, was able to have some degree of impulse control. Would this be across the board? Would this be to do with uh, depression, for instance? Would it be to do with physical abilities? Yeah, there's going to be, whole, there's going to be lots of things that are hugely contentious. So depression is, is one hugely crippling disease. Um, and there's, there is some evidence that how happy we feel is, does have a significant genetic component. It's, it's irrelevant of our circumstances. So it may be that we can, we can choose to have children who have a disposition to have a happier life. What we have to work out is whether there are costs to that. So, for example, there have been some um, highly creative and original people who have had manic depression. So would you want to remove the genes that were associated with manic depression, which can be a crippling disease, but that also reduce creativity and originality? I don't know. You know the slippery slope here, though, which is eugenics, Nazi Germany, which is where you start to selectively breed to get rid of those that you don't want. We practice eugenics when we do screening for Down syndrome, when we do genetic testing of, of fetuses. That is a form of eugenics. What the Nazis did was they forced choices onto people. They forced people to be sterilised. They killed people against their will according to a state-sponsored vision of how society should be. Now, that's not the sort of um, world that I would ever want to see. I think the fundamental value should be one of liberty. People should be free to be able to make these choices and free not to make them. And what we should give people is access to the technology to improve their lives and to improve their children's lives. If they choose not to avail themselves of that technology, that's their choice. That's 
if you protect liberty, that's how you protect yourself against the Nazi eugenic ideal. You say that cloning of a human being is inevitable. The first artificial human being that's created will sit outside of, these are your words, outside of what God and nature intended. Is this redefining what it actually means to be human? Humans will start to change themselves fundamentally and one of the challenges is to, to ensure that we, we remain a whole human community uh, while embracing these changes. You can see why those who are strongly religious would find what you're saying to be highly inflammatory. That is the very opposite of what they believe to be true, which is the spark of human life comes from a divine source. Well, are you ready for those arguments? Well, uh, ready in what sense? Um... Well, they'll be fierce, <laughs> won't they? Because this is... Uh, you're not just putting forward an intellectual argument here, you're striking at the very core of somebody's belief system. I think as a society we're going to have to face um, the, the sort of growing division between people who hold quite strong fundamental religious beliefs uh, and those who don't. And the question is whose values are going to be imposed on who? I'm all in favour of people practising a diversity of religions. I'm very supportive of, of having you know, religious practices. What I don't believe is those values should be should be imposed on people who don't share them. Um, just, I mean, people have objected to genetic testing of, of fetuses and embryos for serious diseases on exactly this ground that you're playing God. You should accept the child that that God gives you. Now, I'm very I'm very supportive of people making those decisions in their own lives, but I don't think that I or you should have to have the child that they deem that we should have on the basis of their belief in God. What are we actually capable of doing? I get the feeling that there's stuff going on that I don't know about. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff where uh, really that are kind of right outside people's radar. I mean, a few months ago, scientists created the first fluorescent human embryo. And what they did was they took a gene from a jellyfish and, and put it into a human embryo. Now, so they did this a number of years ago. They created a live-born fluorescent uh, rabbit. And what this shows is that you can transfer genes from one species into humans effectively. Now, nobody, I, I take it, is that interested in creating fluorescent humans, but there was a very, another very interesting experiment a number of months ago where scientists tweaked one gene that metabolises, that uses up sugar in the body in these mice, and they created a, a, a so-called super mouse. And these mice were 60% leaner, had 10% cholesterol, lived much longer, were able to reproduce to the age of, of, of a human of, of 80 years. And these, these mice were, were designed to look at the effects of exercise and longevity and heart disease. But what we can do is do exactly the same thing in humans. We could, we could tweak, we have exactly the same sugar cycle as the mouse. So there is no reason that we couldn't do the same sort of experiment and create superhumans as we've created super mice. So biology is already there. People you know, think Planet of the Apes is a science fiction movie. Uh, it's not a science fiction movie. Um, I was talking to Doug Melton, the famous scientist and stem cells at Harvard, and he said, with six million US dollars, you could create a live-born human-chimp chimera, a mixture between a human and a chimp. So we can create life forms that have never existed. Craig Venter is creating synthetic life, life from the ground up, just using chemicals, not using any existing animal. We could create things that have never existed in the world until this point. What would the benefits of a human chimp creation be? Well, one benefit would be you could study at what point humans acquired the ability to, to speak and understand and communicate with language. So if that was necessary to understand that, that would be one reason. You might at some point in a human epidemic want to create either transgenic, you know, that is humans with genes from other species, in, in order to confer resistance to epidemics. So my own view is these these really radical possibilities won't be entertained until there's a very clear need or benefit. But there may be in the future. Haven't you seen The Fly? <laughs> yes, I've seen... I was, I, I was, I'm so old that I saw the original. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that bother you? Well, I mean... It does bother me, but there are also urgent reasons to take this stuff seriously. Uh, there are some fundamentally evil people, and there are people who will be prone to use this technology to wreak vast havoc on, on humanity. So when we were reasonably protected from, from human nature through, through human history, but it may be now we really need to address uh, our fundamental nature and, and the internal drivers to, to 
to causing this sort of evil and destruction. And it may be at some point that our only hope is to modify ourselves. When Judgment Day happens and God comes down, where do you think he's going to put scientists? <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that uh, question is going to be. I'll give you a hint. It's going to be hot. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, uh, I think uh, the hope for humanity, as, as Hawking said in the long term, is it has to be science because the Earth won't be here forever. We are experiencing a spike this century in the power of technology uh, and we need, to, we need to use that properly. The only problem with that model is that the human model has to be rebooted once every 70 years and it starts at the same point each time. Well, there are people, uh, and I'm not one of them, but there is, a, there is one fellow who says the first 1,000-year-old person is alive today. Um, and the idea behind this is that at the moment we've basically won the war on disease. Even if we cured all diseases, we'd only extend human lifespan by about 7 to 10 years. What's killing us now is ageing. And if we actually scientifically started a war on ageing instead of terror um, and looked at this properly, we could correct, reverse and prevent the ageing process. And if you did that, uh, humans could potentially live to a 1,000 years. Now, we won't, I think, see that in our lifespan, but we may well see the development of stem cell science prolonging people's lives beyond 120 years. So it's an exciting time, at least for my children, and I think we will see fundamental changes to the human condition. If you get religion, you're going to have the cosmetics companies coming down so hard and you, nothing must stop ageing. <laughs> you put a lot of uh, things on the table. Do you necessarily support all of them or are some of them just there for us to think about? Yeah, look, um, I, I'm not an evangelist and I'm not out to convert people and uh, I, I think the sign of a success in my job is that people go away thinking for themselves what their view is. Um, I don't care if people don't agree with me and often I put arguments simply there for them to be considered. So the, the doping in sport one is one that I think that needs to be taken seriously. I don't know what my final view is. I've even given arguments for things that I don't believe in because I think they, the arguments need to be made. So I have a view of, of practical ethics that it's about empowering people to make their own decisions. And um, what I see increasingly is a, is a kind of moral oppression of one particular view. And, and, and my job is, is really just to put, put the arguments out there and get you to think. Julian Savlesky, very interesting to talk to you. Thank you. My pleasure.